Chapter 15, The Old Hostler. After this, it was decided by my master and mistress to pay a visit to some friends who lived about 46 miles from our home, and James was to drive them. The first day we traveled 32 miles. There were some long, heavy hills, but James drove so carefully and thoughtfully that we were not at all harassed. He never forgot to put on the brake as we went downhill, nor to take it off at the right place. He kept our feet on the smoothest part of the road, and if the uphill was very long, he set the carriage wheels a little across the road so as not to run back and gave us a breathing. All these little things help a horse very much, particularly if he gets kind words into the bargain. We stopped once or twice on the road, and just as the sun was going down, we reached the town where we were to spend the night. We stopped at the principal hotel, which was in the marketplace. It was a very large one. We drove under an archway into a long yard, at the further end of which were the stables and coach houses. Two hostlers came to take us out. The head hostler was a pleasant, active little man with a crooked leg and a yellow striped waistcoat. I never saw a man unbuckle harness so quickly as he did, and with a pat and a good word, he led me to a long stable with six or eight stalls in it and two or three horses. The other man brought Ginger. James stood by while we were rubbed down and cleaned. I never was cleaned so lightly and quickly as by that little old man. When he had done, James stepped up and felt me over as if he thought I could not be thoroughly done, but he found my coat as clean and smooth as silk. This is James and the old man. Well, he said, I thought I was pretty quick and our John quicker still, but you do beat all I ever saw for being quick and thorough at the same time. Practice makes perfect, said the crooked little hostler, and twould be a pity if it didn't. Forty years practice and not perfect? Ha ha, that would be a pity. And as to being quick, why bless you, that is only a matter of habit. If you get into the habit of being quick, it is just as easy as being slow. Easier, I should say. In fact, it don't agree with my health to be hawking about over a job twice as long as it need take. Bless you, I couldn't whistle if I crawled over my work as some folks do. You see, I've been about horses ever since I was 12 years old, in hunting stables and racing stables. And being small, you see, I was jockey for several years. But at the Goodwood, Goodwood, you see, the turf was very slippery and my poor larkspur got a fall and I broke my knee. And so, of course, I was of no more use there. But I could not live without horses. Of course I couldn't. So I took to the hotels. And I can tell you, it is a downright pleasure to handle an animal like this, well-bred, well-mannered, well-cared for. Bless you. I can tell how a horse is treated. Give me the handling of a horse for 20 minutes and I'll tell you what sort of a groom he has had. <clears throat> Look at this one, pleasant, quiet, turns about just as you want him, holds up his feet to be cleaned out or anything else you please to wish. Then you'll find another fidgety, fretty, won't move the right way or starts across the stall, tosses up his head as soon as you come near him, lays his ears and seems afraid of you or else squares about at you with his heels. Poor things, I know what sort of treatment they have had. If they are timid, it makes them start or shy. If they are high-mettled, it makes them vicious or dangerous. Their tempers are mostly made when they are young. Bless you, they are like children. Train them up in the way they should go, as the good book says, and when they are old, they will not depart from it, if they have a chance. I like to hear you talk, said James. That's the way we lay it down at home, at our master's. Who is your master, young man? If it be a proper question, I should judge if he is a good one from what I see. He is Squire Gordon of Burtwick Park, the other side of the Beacon Hills, said James. Ah, so, so, I have heard tell of him. Fine judge of horses, ain't he? The best rider in the county. Oh, I believe he is, said James, but he rides very little now since the poor young master was killed. Ah, poor gentleman. I read all about it in the paper at the time. A fine horse killed too, wasn't there? Yes, said James. He was a splendid creature, brother to this one, and just like him. Pity, pity, said the old man. Twas a bad place to leap, if I remember. 
A thin fence at top, a steep bank down to the stream, wasn't it? No chance for a horse to see where he's going. Now I am for bold riding as much as any man, but still there are some leaps that only a very knowing old huntsman has any right to take. A man's life and a horse's life are worth more than a fox's tail. At least I should say they ought to be. During this time, the other man had finished Ginger and had brought our corn, and James and the old man left the stable together. Just a little reminder that their master, who is so kind, his son was killed on a horse. Remember at the beginning of the book? And so that changes a person a lot of times, but it didn't make this master sad or mean. All right. I'll see you next time when we will read chapter 16, The Fire.